Professor Michelle Dalino and I uh, from the Archaeological Sciences Center at IIT Gandhinagar. We are pleased to welcome all of you to the 22nd lecture of the webinar series that we have been conducting now for more than a year. Um, so this is a monthly lecture series where we have excellent speakers come and enlighten us with different topics about our past. And uh, mostly we do it um, online. And sometimes we are privileged to have our guest speakers visit us at the Institute, in which case we uh, conduct this, this series in, an, in a hybrid mode. So uh, today we have with us the wonderful Professor Robin Cunningham. I will, uh, of course, uh, introduce uh, him to you briefly. Um, but before that, um, let me just quickly tell you that the talk is going to, it's titled Beyond the Sacred City, repositioning Anuradhapura within its hinterland. And as we all know, Anuradhapura is a very uh, important and famous UNESCO World Heritage Site. It is one of Asia's major Buddhist pilgrimage centers and um, was Sri Lanka's capital for more than 15 centuries. And this lecture is based on an extensive field survey, which helped in understanding the complex network of um, secular and religious hierarchies linking the urban core and the rural hinterland. So um, um, many of us are, of course, familiar with Professor Cunningham and his works, but for those who are kind of uninitiated, I would, uh, I'll just quickly um, introduce him to you. So he was formerly the pro vice chancellor and executive dean of Durham's Faculty of Social Sciences and Health. And he's currently the professor of archaeology and uh, holds uh, UNESCO's chair in archaeological ethics and practice in cu cultural heritage since 2014. He's an extremely active field researcher, and he's conducted extensive field work in Bangladesh, Iran, India, Nepal, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka, uh, aimed at enhancing our understanding of the developmental sequences of urbanization and trade in Southern Asia and across the Indian Ocean um, uh, territory. So he started working with UNESCO in 1997 and has participated in over 30 UNESCO missions with the aim to build and strengthen the ethical and balanced promotion of heritage to enhance the sustainable development of regions, especially those with living religious and pilgrimage sites. So um, he's the international advisor in archaeology for UNESCO and uh, the government of Nepal and their World Heritage Sites and chairs the Research and Dissemination Committee of Durham's UNESCO World Heritage um, Site. So he has been serving an, as an advisory and as an expert on panels for UNESCO, UK National Commission for UNESCO, the Arts and Humanities Research Council, the British Academy, the UK Academies' Resilient Futures Board, and is the chair of the Antiquity Trust. He has published over 100 academic papers and chapters, as well as 10 books. Um, some of the most important ones include Archaeology, Heritage Protection and Community Engagement in South Asia in 2019, and Appropriating the Past, Philosophical Perspectives on the Practice of Archaeology in 2013. So um, he's now the co-director of Durham's uh, master's program in International Cultural Heritage Management and has supervised 18 doctoral candidates to successful completion and awards. So we are very, very privileged and happy to have you here with us. Um, so um, I now pass the virtual mic to Professor Conningham and I request you to begin your talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sharada, for, for the, the kind uh, introduction. I'm really grateful to IIT Gandhi Nagar for the, for the invitation to speak. Um, particularly because I had the pleasure of, uh, of visiting um, uh, very recently, and we're really excited to see how uh, relationships, partnerships in terms of teaching and research can be further built. I'm very grateful to uh, Professor uh, Michel Danino for, for his support as well, and also to Professor Pravika, who uh, of course is in the field. And then one of your, one of your visiting professors, Professor Krishnan, um, who I have known since I was an undergraduate. Um, I'll start by saying, although my name is the name on the presentation, I really do need to name those who co-produce this work, um, because, of course, when one works in the field, you can either be a solitary scholar or you can work in an interdisciplinary fashion. 
And increasingly, the only way we can target and tackle the big challenges, whether they are global challenges or whether they are specific archaeological research challenges, interdisciplinarity has to be the way forward. And so in particular, my Sri Lankan colleagues like Prashant Gunawardna from Kalenia University, also Gamni Adhikari from Kalenia, Jagath Wirasinghe and others, because these are really core partnerships in terms of changing what are uh, perspectives that are very, very long, um, long set. Um, and now just I will attempt to um, to now open the challenge in terms of the full screen. I am hoping you can see full screen now. Yes, we can. Perfect. Okay. So um, as uh, Professor Sharada said, what I've chosen to focus on is Anuradhapura. And really it's because it highlights for me some of the challenges about understanding the early historic world and also understanding early historic South Asia. Um, and also, uh, as Professor Sharada uh, intimated, um, Anuradhapura is a World Heritage Site recognized by UNESCO, and that gives us a form of partnership because, of course, my own home university is also UNESCO World Heritage Site, part of that, part of that world. And indeed, the work that we undertake, uh, particularly within South Asia, is linked to that network of UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Here are my uh, two very, uh, very long-standing colleagues, um, uh, Kosh Prasadacharya, former Director General of Archaeology, Basanta Bidari, uh, Bidari, former Chief Archaeologist at Lumbini Development Trust, inside the Maya Devi Temple, but that's, that's a very different lecture. So what I'd like to do is start focusing on Anuradhapura. And Anuradhapura is one of the great centers, one of the great uh, cities with a longitudinal occupation, is based about 120 kilometers inland. So already it's slightly different because Sri Lanka being an island, but actually this uh, capital site is inland. Um, it's a site which is quite complex, as you can see from the right. It has a citadel mound, the so-called city, which is red in the interior. And then it has uh, what is termed the sacred city, this area of almost 25 square kilometers of monasteries around it, and then a series of huge water bodies. Um, it is recognized as the capital for over uh, uh, 1,500 years, and also it is embedded in some of the very early histories, some of the, uh, some of the Buddhist traditions within the Mahavamsa about, uh, about uh, Vijaya, his, uh, his occupation of the island at the same time as, as the Buddha's Nirvana, and it plays an important role within the identity and histories. Uh, of the island. And of course, it's also core because this is where Mahendra, which some traditions identify as the son of uh, uh, the Emperor Soka, introduced Buddhism uh, at Mahindale, just uh, within sight of the ancient city. Um, it's also a site where we have some uh, historical records. The journeys of the Chinese pilgrim, Fa San, actually records Anuradhapura during his journey and the thousands of monks supported, 5,000 monks supported in the Abhigiri Vihara, a further 3,000 in the Mahavihara, giving an idea of the surplus required and also its significance in terms of already this Buddhist circuit um, in the early medieval period. And as I mentioned, we tend to think of it in a series of blocks. The World Heritage Site um, surrounds, the, uh, surrounds the secular city, which measures something like uh, um, 100 hectares. 
And then we have 25 square kilometers. Um, some of the monastic sites, some of the monuments are over 100 meters high. And then we have these vast irrigation works as well. Uh, this gives you some of the uh, idea of some of these massive monuments. Uh, Mirisavati uh, measuring almost 60 meters high. Uh, Ruin Velisaya on the right is said to contain 200 million bricks. And of course, we have Sri Mahabodhi, the, uh, the tree, uh, a sapling from Bodhgaya uh, brought um, by, uh, by Mahendra in the third century BCE. So a massive place of, of these, uh, these mega infrastructure uh, set around um, immovable uh, relics. And of course, it's not just an archaeological site, it's a living site. During the great festivals, Vesak and Poisson, actually the site becomes alive. Millions of people reoccupy the sacred city. And when you see it, it, it must give something close to, uh, to an idea of what it was historically. What's the most striking about this, this massive construction, is actually it sits within what is known the dry zone of the island. So it has a long dry season for months. Um, the local infrastructure supports rice and millets. And also, actually, there is a very low carrying capacity without irrigation agriculture. So this landscape um, support something like 0.5 people per square kilometers without irrigation. The moment you bring in irrigation, you can actually transform the landscape. And in this so-called dry zone, you can actually begin to have huge concentrations of population. And this is the way that we begin to now understand that the hinterland, which today is often um, village tank system, bottom right, or top left, you have the so-called Shena, which is the dry farming. Actually, it's transformed by very simple gravity uh, irrigation. Uh, bottom left, the very simplistic approach of creating a bund, and then you create water. And it's been said by uh, Edmund Leach, the famous uh, anthropologist, this is hydraulic civilization. Because over time, those small feeder tanks have been augmented by tanks that bring in water from other water systems. Canals over 80 kilometers long, all fed by gravity. Um, studied in the revival of this area in the 19th century, early 20th centuries by individuals like Bro here. And actually we see this very intense investment in irrigation to support that massive population of animals and people and pilgrims at the sacred city and the uh, mercantile center of Anuradhapura. Now, it is true to say that much of the early work was focused on the massive monastic structures. And to some extent, like many of the early historic cities within Southern Asia, actually the city itself has been somewhat neglected. And this was recognized by some of the early pioneers like Siram Duraniadla. So focusing on the city is when I first came into contact with Anuradhapura. Um, as a PhD student, I was invited uh, to work with my supervisor, um, Raymond Alchin from Cambridge, and also under the direction of Roland Silver and also Siran Deraniagla to excavate a trench, ASW2, in more or less the center of the city, uh, covering something like 100 hectares um, and that's where we were given a site. Here is the site before we started excavating. Um, there in the bottom right is a photograph uh, from those years um, with uh, Alfred de Mel, who was one of the most striking and professional um, uh, foremen I have ever had the pleasure and privilege to work in. This trench ASW2 measured 10 meters by 10 meters. It was the perfect cube. It was also 10 meters deep. 
And we had this incredible sequence that ran with our radiocarbon dates from about 900 BCE till about 1100, 1200 CE. So this incredible sequence, the location within those 10 meters actually gave us an incredible sequence through the city, moving from timber structures circular in the very early years, then into the introduction of rectangular square structures, the introduction of tile, then into brick with limestone, then into the use of ashlar pillars in the early first millennium CE, and then the reuse of more impermanent structures. So an insight into what we now understand is a transformation from a village, an Iron Age village, into one of South Asia's greatest urban sites. And here you have in the very early levels, those Iron Age, these sort of uh, late Iron Age levels, you can see bottom left one of the, uh, one of the circular um, structures there. And what's e interesting is even in these very early dates, we have evidence that this site 120 kilometers inland is part of Indian Ocean trade. We have Carnelian coming in. We have uh, from, of course, Western India. We have grey wares which link us over into Peninsular India. We're part of that great tradition of black and red wares. And also we have clear quartz top left coming in from the hill country of Sri Lanka. In the next phases, we begin to get the introduction of rectangular square structures. Here you can see the earlier roundhouses are replaced by these, these more permanent structures with multiple uh, post holes. And you can see also the quality of preservation. Um, all archaeology is something of a gamble. We were extremely lucky with this unbroken sequence. And there we began to find imports from further afield, NBP. Um, and also lapis lazuli, bottom right, from uh, Badakhshan in Afghanistan, part of those networks. And then we also began to find evidence of early Brahmi, uh, earlier than the third century BC, supported by, uh, by radiocarbon dates and confirming what Saranda and Iagla had often stated, that actually early Brahmi actually predates the Asokan monuments and its earlier iteration is actually on ceramics, mainly in the dative um, uh, and genitive cases. And this is also the point where we find the city fortified. On the right, uh, with an old friend of mine, Ruxhan Jar Wardner, there we have the medieval wall. On the left, this is the earliest rampart constructed at this time. And then we begin to get an intensification, the use of limestone floors. Uh, we have uh, iron brackets around timber to get us height. And we begin to pick up within the archeology span experimentation with timber posts. Um, we also come into the world of Indian Ocean trade. We have cut glass top left from uh, probably from Alexandria. We have uh, uh, late Roman coins bottom left. And on the right is an almost complete ivory mirror stand um, made of a tusk. An incredible preservation that we have. And also we have linkages into those ceramics manufactured more locally, um, Arakamedu type 10, which is top left. We have black slipwares with roulettes and also of course, rouletted ware, um, Arakamedu type one, which we know from the studies of Professor Krishnan indicate um, not an Indo, uh, not a, a Roman import, but of course, um, a, 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 a ceramic manufactured within Southern Asia. And this is a period which then is followed by the experimentation from timber into, um, into uh, uh, Ganice, where we have these huge pillars. And we have a pillar hall, which luckily for us, sealed below it all the other sequences. This pillared hall um, was actually one of a number at this time. This is when 
pillared construction spreads across the city. And we're very close to the old Mahapali, which is identified by Seneca Bandranayaka as being close to the palace. And also on the right is one of these massive granite rice boats, which shows in the monastery the amount of surplus available to serve the monks from the kitchens of the palace. And then it's followed by a phase where we find um, evidence of trade with the Sasanian Islamic world. We also have torpedo jars with bitumen coating, analysis of the bitumen by Jacques Connor and also by colleagues like Carl Heron um, indicate that actually the bitumen is from Iran near Susa. And it's ended up being traded, probably the vessels empty, being retraded and brought to Anuradhapura inland. And then we come into some of the more difficult phases, the final phases of occupation, where, as you can see here, we have a series of robber pits. These cut into the early structures. Often they are uh, aimed at taking out the granite pillars to reuse. And then right on the top, we have uh, more ephemeral type structures, but there's nothing ephemeral about the imports. We have lusterwares, monochrome lusterwares. We have imitation lusterwares from Iran, from Nishapur, indicating that this, uh, this Indian Ocean trade is very strong within the Persian Gulf, within the Red Sea. And also we have evidence of East Asian trade as well. So the excavation at ASW2 gave us this incredible sequence of trade from the uh, Iron Age through into the medieval period and Anuradhapura being at the center. As I've mentioned, what's most striking is actually this material and there must be tons of it is all brought 120 kilometers inland from the coast. Um, here at top right is one of the famous graffito that we have from the site. And here is, you can see a ship on it. Um, left actually is one of the stone bridges close to Anuradhapura, but we have very little in the way of infrastructure. Most of it undoubtedly brought in either by humans or by buffalo carts. But also we need to recognize that Anuradhapura is not just a passive recipient of materials, but is a manufacturing center. Bottom left, we have glass um, uh, actually melted. So it's a, uh, you can see the um, bottom left, you can see some of where the crucible has been there. So it's an ingot. Top right, we have a blank of carnelian from Western India. We have evidence of manufacturing in probably bone, in ivory, and then top left, we've got metal working as well. And archeologically more difficult to find, we assume part of this trade is timber and is spices and peppers, as has been found from Manti. Now that's the story of one trench. Siran Duraniagla, seen here on the right next to uh, Nimal Pereira, was the pioneer, sadly uh, lost, uh, very recently, but the pioneer who cut what we called a series of death pits, trenches measuring three, uh, three meters by three meters, and he cut 13 across the city, giving us an idea of how that very small village, Iron Age village, began to grow from something like 26 um, square hectares, uh, 26 hectares into a city by the medieval period of uh, 100 hectares. And very much the focus on the city at that time, and in a way giving us an insight into the growth of a single city, um, yes, enhanced better than others, but actually we began to realize what about beyond the city? Now, I have to, at this point, introduce my colleagues, Prashantika Nawardna here on the left, who actually began to encourage us to look beyond the city and looking at ways in which we could try and understand the relationship of the city to the hinterland. To his right is Gami Adhikari. Um, we also have a very young Professor Krishnan there and my colleague um, Armin Schmidt as well. Um, but actually interdisciplinarity was key, driven by this incredibly strong um, field team. 
Our questions were, we understood how Anuradhapura grew, but how did the landscape, settlement within the landscape change? How did the environment change? Were certain traits actually restricted to the city or were they shared? And also, was the plain entirely abandoned after 1100? So one of the challenges is, this is the landscape. How do you begin to try to interrogate that landscape? Now, we know from the seminal work on the inscriptions that there were hierarchies within the landscapes. There are kings, there are high kings, there are senapatis, ministers, there are village headmen in the inscriptions dotted across the landscape. But how do we archaeologically identify them? And then also, we tend to go back to our touchstone, the Arthur Sastra, with its concept of how the city is laid out, how the landscape, the kingdoms are laid out. Is this true of areas beyond the, uh, beyond the central uh, Janapadas, Mahajanapadas? Certainly, Makanlal, Georgia Dursi, bottom right, had begun to find evidence of multiple tiers of uh, function and settlement, but was this true of the landscape? So what we did was we put in a random series of transects to walk. So over a period of five years, students from Kalenia University, students from uh, Durham University, Bradford, Leicester, uh, PJIR, worked together to try to actually pick up settlements within the landscape. Um, so we had something close to 25, 20 kilometer long transects. Here is one of the early field teams, and they are the ones who are in the field. We had the pleasure of staying in the Department of Archaeology, who supported us hugely in their circuit bungalow. And also here is a young Professor Krishnan giving evening lectures to the students, many of those students are now lecturers. So it shows actually the formative process that this had. Here, bottom left is Professor um, Mangala Katugampola, head of department at Kalenia. And some of the challenges of survey, where you have to cross rivers, go through elephant grass, and how can you have a systematic survey? This part of the survey, the field walking, was to find sites. The next part of the survey was to auger seen here, and also to do geophysics, to try and characterize sites. Here's Professor Armin Schmidt doing some of the follow-up, where a sample of the sites we found, we then did geophysics, auguring to find depth, and then we followed up with excavation to try to characterize the different types of sites. And of course, the geoarchaeology with Professor Ian Simpson from the University of Stirling, trying to give us an idea actually of how settlement and the hydraulic landscape came together. After five years and almost 250,000 pounds of investment from the Arts and Humanities Research Council, we found a total of 755 sites. So a massive number. The majority of our sites were very small, scatters of ceramics, no more than about five by five meters, um, often only visible through a scatter of ceramics on the surface. When they were excavated, they provided ceramics, very few, if any, imported materials, and also post holes. So very simple village settlement, probably short-lived. Two sites were larger, uh, Rajaligama was one, which was a larger site, evidence of imported materials, but this was an exceptional site. Many, many monastic sites, these, these uh, natural caves with a drip ledge to augment them, and often inscriptions, so lots of monastic sites. And the monastic sites we found were deep, long-lived, and also often um, with access to both manufacturing, but also to long distance travel. But not just uh, um, orthodox monastic sites, also we found some quite large later ones, like the site of Zoo, a massive site, 
and also some meditational monasteries. Meditational, uh, these are the uh, well-known category quite late, and they have no decoration on them, no images of the Buddha, no, uh, no Bodhi trees, and the orna only ornamentation is of Vihara's bottom right on the urinal slabs. So very, very distinctive category of sites. And also a category of sites that didn't belong to what we might perceive of orthodox Buddhism, but terracotta sites, anthropomorphized phalluses. Uh, we have evidence bottom right of, uh, of quite large figurines. Um, so scattered along the landscape. With the series of excavations as, as well, we began to be able to date when the irrigation system started. So uh, about 250 uh, BCE, 300 BCE, and also when the, uh, when the channels and the tanks were abandoned as well. Of course, dating sites in the, sea, in the landscape is so difficult. We relied on radiocarbon dates, OSL dates, and also artifacts linked to the deep sequences in Anuradhapura, and of course the architectural features. So of course, chronology is always going to be the most difficult. And we divided the landscape to link to the city into five main groups, a proto-historic, an early historic, an early historic two, an early medieval, and then a late medieval. And these are quite broad bands, but we felt this was important to interpret um, the landscape. We also began to investigate some of the stupas because one tends to think of them as monolithic. When we did OSL dating, we found that actually there was a distinctive pattern of having smaller focal stupas built at a later part time on top. So we were able using OSL dates to see that many of the outer stupas uh, were constructed fourth century CE, but then in about the eighth century CE, we began to get these smaller focal stupas built on top. Now, what it's given us is an insight into the colonization and the impact of urbanization across the landscape. With Anuradhapura and then steadily in the proto-historic period, settlement being clustered near watercourses, permanent watercourses. In the early historic, we get this intensifying, this population, um, mostly smaller sites, but increasing in number as the landscape is populated. In the early historic two, we begin to get artificial irrigation coming in, gravity tanks, and again, the settlement spreads and intensifies. So by the medieval period, we have landscape, um, all almost all elements of landscape occupied with these settlements often clustering near these artificial water. And then after about 1100, we have almost a complete removal of population, a few sites left, and the irrigation works very much as well, um, sort of uh, drying up literally. So looking at those, looking at the data, what we can begin to draw is an understanding of what's happening in the landscape. Early occupation is focused around the village, uh, around the river valleys in the initial period. And then steadily, it expands into new areas away from the water. The landscape then becomes more densely occupied. And then by the late medieval period, the majority of those settlements actually leave. But some settlements are very long lived. What is absolutely clear is it's only in that early historic period that we get towns and Anuradhapura right from the very beginning is the preeminent city, always the preeminent settlement from the Iron Age onwards. So this isn't a question of a landscape of equals where one begins to intensify Anuradhapura from its initial establishment is always the larger settlement.
And also, we can then begin to link Anuradhapura, the sacred city, the uh, hydraulic works with the landscape around it to see how the two work. Going back to that earlier model from the Arthasastra, clearly the model doesn't work. We do not have these provincial headquarters, divisional headquarters, district headquarters. Actually, towns are almost entirely absent. And we began to look at modeling the landscape. And we began to find that on the, on the top left, right at the left where you have this massive settlement, that's Anuradhapura. All of the other settlements are really quite small. But actually, at about 25 kilometers out from the city, we get one largest settlement. And in terms of size, actually, that is a larger settlement. That's this site, Rajaligama, which actually doesn't live for long. So we have one apparent town within this landscape. Looking at stupas and monasteries, what we actually believe that we have is what we call the monastic shadow. Close to Anuradhapura in the sacred city, we have a large number of stupa sites, but then almost up to about uh, 14 uh, kilometers out from the city, we have nothing. And then from there, we begin to get frequent, um, frequent stupas. So we almost have a monastic shadow where we have, we believe, the authority and the agricultural uh, success of those core major monasteries in the city. And then looking beyond the city, we have these huge stupas close and then smaller stupas building out into the landscape. Now, we began to be struck by the fact that we're missing towns. Where are the towns? Well, actually, maybe it's how we think of as towns. If we think of towns as a series of functions, here is a rather wonderful inscription from the Hintale Vihara, and it lists 149 support staff. And if you look, actually, these are blacksmiths, these are master lapidaries, artisans, uh, potters, painters, thatchers, woodworkers. So actually, all of the functions you'd normally associate with the town actually are being conducted by the monasteries. And indeed, if you look at our archaeological signature of monasteries, they are literate, they have monumental architecture, they have evidence of uh, manufacturing in some places, uh, of elite materials and imports, both nationally and into also Indian Ocean um, imports. So if we look for those linkages, actually we find the landscape is the monasteries, which are distinctive and we have a lack of towns. Now, in the later period, we also begin to have what are called temporalities. So we have a series of uh, decrees, 10th century CE, and this is some of the work done by Malini Dias, followed up by Chris Davis. And actually, these are immunities that actually district headmen, keepers of district records, are not allowed to enter the monastic estates. So no longer are monastic estates allowed to give labor to support um, state organization, nor pay taxes to state. And over time, we begin to find, as this work by Malini Dias and also Chris Davis, that actually alienation of land from the crown increases from almost nothing in the early historic period to the early medieval period. So increasingly, the monasteries are taking over as landlords, but also as independent lands landlords. And if we look at contemporary uh, monasteries, we can see actually many of them even today within the landscape function um, as living centers. They're there for redistribution of uh, population, 
uh, redistribution of surplus, labor, raw material, materials, knowledge, wealth, and of course, consumption. And we began to do some ethnographic uh, interviews with the Piacenas in a village called Katiawa. And this was a new village that was established in the 70s, new irrigation works. And with the new village came a temple that drew the new colonists together to build their community. And they held this very close link. They would give uh, um, a surplus, they would give dana to the monk, and here is the picture of the incumbent. They would also have a very close link to the Mahavihara in Amaradapura. So even though they were over 20 kilometers away, um, and here is the incumbent, they would have a very close link between the village. So it gave this link almost of uh, both to their village temple and also to the central temple. And looking at some of these, we began to, uh, my colleagues um, and I began to look at whether we could call this a theocratic landscape. And we began to investigate that perhaps this contemporary pattern was one in the past. But then very soon we began to think, actually, this is very simplistic. It's almost driven by the monasteries rather than giving villages their own agency. So we began to go back to the village and we found that the couple also went to meditational monasteries, not the orthodox, but meditational monasteries. They also went to a lady nun who lived in a tree. So they also went for this variety of, of Buddhist support. So we began to see this pattern was far more complex. It wasn't just to the center at Anuradhapura and to their own village monastery, but also other monasteries around. We also found that they would go to the oracle um, of Ainaika. So they would go to their village oracle as well. And here is the, uh, here is the oracle himself. But before going to the village oracle, they would always go to the senior oracle uh, at, at Amunakole. So, and we also found that they would also offer the first rice milk at Veragala to the Devi on the top of the outcrop near the village. So you begin to find a very complex set of relationships in the contemporary world. There, where some of it one might see as being central, centralized, center periphery, some of it might be um, uh, heterodoxical, uh, some of it might be orthodox, but a landscape. So we began to recognize that actually we should move beyond very simple models that give a hierarchy, that where you have a city, one expects the smaller sites to be subsidiary to it within the hierarchy, rather like the Arthasastra. And actually, when you start pulling in meditational sites and these terracotta figurine sites from the past, it suggests that you have a really dynamic landscape where villagers are actually um, uh, confronted by the ability to have agency across a series of hierarchies or what we would call a heterarchy, where you have series of uh, competing hierarchies, heterarchies within the landscape. This is not a simple center periphery model, but actually this begins to give um, agency. So we also with colleagues, Roland Fletcher, um, uh, Lisa Lucera begin to experiment with ideas of low density urbanism that actually we see wider networks between hinterland communities, that we see stupas as focal points, but also regional focal points, that buns and canals act as uh, networks, and also the monasteries are hubs, but this isn't a coercive landscape. This is actually, there is a wide variety. This is a contested landscape. There's a wide variety of autonomy, religious, social, and economic. And also all the, way, the while when kings donate land, you have an increasing strength 
of the monastic um, estates within it. So if we think of that model from the, uh, from the Arthur Sastra, we can look at a very different pattern, a pattern where we do have the hub, Anuradhapura, but we have satellites and also some of those, then we have to shrines and agencies. So villages actually have a vast network of communications beyond, far beyond the simplistic uh, patterns that perhaps sometimes we try to give the past. Why should the past be any simpler than the present? Now, this work was very much the generation of the work of, this is one of our final field seasons. You can see we had almost 70 in the field, drawn from the University of Bristol, Bradford, Leicester, Stirling, Baroda, MSU Baroda, Kalenia, PGAIR, um, funded Arts and Humanities, and of course, Durham. Um, not quite a football team, we realize in size, far beyond but actually a, a really exciting experiment in multidisciplinary, multi, uh, multinational research. Now the monographs, there are three monographs on the volumes, which are there because we felt the data was there for others to interpret. And a series of high level papers where we've tried to pitch them towards an international setting. So the Journal of Archeological Science, antiquity as well, three papers in antiquity linked to this work. Now, looking beyond the research, and I'll begin to limber towards an end here, we also realize that our work is beyond just an interrogation of the past, because how can lessons from the past help us? Um, working with colleagues across this tropical uh, forests, working in Southeast Asia, also in the Mayan world, particularly through Roland Fletcher and Lisa Lucero, it began to be an investigation of whether low density urbanism actually is a new form of urbanization that we can recognize. It's different from the traditional intensive uh, restricted models that we tend to go for, 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 you know, which are derived from Europe and even the Mediterranean with the concept of the polis. This is a different pattern, a different response. And also, I'm not an environmental determinist, but also from an in different environmental setting. And then more recently with Lisa Lucero, we were beginning to think about how can this understanding of the past and also the longevity of the systems. Because if you think, we normally think of cities as failing. So we think of historic cities as failing. Anuradhapura survived as an urban center for 1,500 years. This is an extremely impressive adaptation in a landscape which will only support 0.5 people per square kilometer. We have had a vibrant city and landscape for over a millennia, driven by indigenous technologies that we can begin to understand. Now there is a tendency as we explore in that paper in the British Academy Journal for donors to contemporary donors to want to look at mega infrastructure. The bigger the dam, the better. Um, but actually, are we overlooking the success of more indigenous or tradition, traditional management landscape? And actually, are we able to look at how those systems reduce risk, share risk, in a way that the mega infrastructure, which are so expensive and so impactful, can't. So we should be looking to the past for lessons for the future, particularly as we recognize that the sorts of uh, catastrophes are going to intensify. So I would say that this is not just pure research for research's sake. This is also a recognition that we can understand landscape transformation and the successes of 
indigenous technology, but also the stories from Anuradhapura and elsewhere within the uh, tropical uh, uh, adaptation of how we can over adapt so that actually uh, disaster risk and resilience begins to be reduced. And so those are some of the areas where I think archaeology is not just a science of exploring the past, but actually we need to find our voices to influence uh, the future as well. Um, I have to go back to my colleagues, Prashantagana Wardner and also Gami Adhikari, uh, Jagath Wirasinghe and others because, and of course the youthful uh, Professor Krishnan, because actually these are the colleagues who drove this project. And if we are to start examining the purpose of archeology span in the new millennia, actually we can begin to think that we have a voice, we have a role to play. So thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I realize it's whirlwind, any errors are my own. Um, any successes are shared with the team for whom all of this work is, is massive testament. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Conningham. That was a very, um, uh, you know, a talk packed with so many different ideas and concepts and you not just made us kind of become a part of the history of Anuradhapura, but you also made us rethink and redefine some of our concepts on urbanism and cities and towns and um, uh, especially draw attention to the fact that we should not just look at the site in isolation, but see its environs as well and how each contributes to the other's uh, growth. So um, um, thank you so much for the talk. And now I, I request all the participants, um, if they have any comments, questions, any, any thoughts they want to share as well, um, please do so in the Q&A box so that we can have them all in one uh, place. And I, I will uh, kind of not miss out on the important ones. So I already see that there are a few pointed questions and a few general questions, and I think we can take them up uh, I'll try to club those which are kind of on similar lines. So, um, okay, so the, the, the first one that I'll take up is by Sharmishta, who thanks you for this brilliant talk. And uh, she has two queries. The first one is, do you think that the core periphery model would work for the main monastic complex and the hinterland? Okay, that, um, that, that is a very good question. So thank you for that. Um, I think when we look at the complexities of Anuradhapura, we are assisted very much by the textual records. And within Anuradhapura, we actually have different chapters. So we have three major, almost competing chapters. So core periphery begins to fragment because even within the city, those monastic chapters are not always working in consort. And there are records of them working to undermine one another. So I think the core periphery model is powerful. In some environments, it will fit. But I think for this sort of complexity, it, it's, it's too simple. It's just too simple a model. And I think it's when we begin to recognize the complexities that are there, that's the point at which we will begin to free ourselves from, from those sorts of shackles. I will say there is a huge amount of additional work that could be done. For example, uh, if we were to do work on food production, are we looking at food production within the villages or within the uh, that monastic uh, that monastic shadow? Um, what's the relationship coming in? We still don't know those sorts of questions. So I'd say core periphery models were great when they came out, but they are simplistic, only overly simplistic. And the moment you touch on the historic records, it shows how often archaeologists are just too simplistic. 
Um, so the second, not so much a query, I, I see that it's more like a statement by the same participant, Sharmishta. So she says the new urbanism forms that we are witnessing is sustainable, which seems to be so in many aspects. So um, it, it seems more like a, you know, a statement and maybe you can share your thoughts on that. Yeah, uh, I mean, some of my colleagues like Roland Fletcher from Sydney um, would argue that actually the evidence that we have for these extremely long lived successful cities suggests that actually we ought to go back to the drawing board for how we define sustainability. Um, and the paper with Lisa Lucero in the British Academy Journal that came out um, in December last year is open access, so anyone can see it for free. Um, actually, we, we argue that, um, that actually sustainability can actually link to these forms of studies. Um, the challenge that we would argue for Anuradhapura is that the, there is almost an over-adaptation and you begin to get into this cycle where if you over-adapt, over-invest in the landscape, um, you are almost restricted in your ability to, to offer greater resilience. So some people would identify um, that, that actually once you're locked in to this sort of huge hydraulic system, when you get cyclones, where the, when you get, it's normally too much water, this can breach bums and in a gravity series of tanks, it just breaches one after another after another. If you also have paddy out, it will just strip your paddy. Um, so there is this inherent um, thread that if you over adapt, actually it can undermine the system. Um, but then I would say it's far more sustainable than these massive tank systems where you have, for example, Victoria down in Sri Lanka. It's never full. Um, the amount of land it was taken up, many of the, the population that was um, that was removed from that landscape haven't been fully integrated back. And it's never produced what it was promised to produce. So I'd say. Um, Yes, there are elements where we can have greater sustainability, but also, also you know, Lisa Lucero would call it uh, path dependencies. Once you have too great a path dependency, your ability to, to reverse your adaptation is, is highly limited. And we believe that actually it was far easier to resettle within Polonarua um further to the uh, further to the south and the east um then actually try to retrofit anuradhapura okay uh so the next question is by mahesh chandra the very first question where he mm -hmm. asks is there any archaeological proof or evidence i guess which is found in the ramayana um uh, about sri lanka well <laughs> Um, that that is a um, that is a uh, a hook for for anyone and, a, and an elephant trap as as well. Um, I think the, the the nature of archaeology and tradition is really exciting, and in terms of the Ramayana, uh, there are some scholars who would argue that the early the early Iron Age can be linked to it before the arrival of Vijaya. Um, the places at which archaeology and tradition come together are often invisible to us as scholars. So as yet, uh, we have not. I know there are many colleagues, many, uh, many people who are extremely excited um who have encouraged the development of a ramayana trail and they've linked together caves um and sites uh in a trail um far from me to question intangible um but i would say at this point in terms of the archaeology 
we don't really know what to look for and how we would recognize it. Um, so whilst we can see some elements where say the Mahavamsa um, has elements which, which are there irrefutably archeologically for the Ramayana, it's, it's a much, much more difficult question and some questions may be rather more complex for archeology span to answer in its current state of scientific knowledge. Okay. Um, so the next question is by Ravikant Prasad, who is a, a postdoc uh, uh, in our center. So he asks, uh, uh, he would like to know whether ceramic samples have been studied in these uh, from these sites and what kind of research questions or archaeological interpretations can be made if someone wants to study the ceramics yeah. in these particular locations? Yeah, I, I mean, we have been so lucky working, first of all, with Saran Derniagla. Who, is, who was the pioneer of the Citadel and Anuradhapura. And he was the one who first pulled together the typologies. And I think what is really important is there has been this tradition across South Asia of always focusing on the deluxe wares, partly, and, and I'm guilty of the same crime, in that they are easily recognizable in the field. But it means that we tend to neglect what the more utilitarian coursewares can actually help us understand. And so, for example, um, you have uh, um, you have vessels which are used for separating uh, rice from from chaff, etc. They are really exciting elements of demonstrating core evidence of food processing, not consumption. So there are some really interesting um, investigations that we can undertake, and we have in our mind to have a fourth volume, um, which moves beyond provenance, but into actually understanding how we might begin to look at the pattern of landscape of food production, food consumption, and look at the city as well. So those are some of the questions. Professor Krishnan is also working on a really exciting um, topic. Uh, we're working on it currently of roof tiles. Because again, you know, something like brick, anyone can make a brick and fire it, but roof tiles within the monastic landscape must be made by uh, master artisans. So can we look at roof tiles in the same way we would do ceramics, thin section analysis, to see are these centrally produced or are these just set up independently as they move around? Now, we did do work on GCMS um, and we did pick up some material, but unfortunately it wasn't a great success in terms of result. So one of the things I would love to, for us to do is return to do GCMS, to begin to look at some of the anthropological attributions for vessels and to see, okay, we may say that this is a handy, etc., but actually is that a, an anthropomorphic sort of fixation we have in the past where they use for multiple um, multiple uses. And then some of the work we've done is with GCMS um, in terms of the uh, in terms of the um, uh, the bitumen coating and using that wonderful database um, set up uh, by Jacques Connell, being able to place the vessel in Sousa for its bitumen, it's for probably wine, but it ends up in Anuradhapura and some end up on the flower altars at Jetavana. So we have this really interesting repurposing of vessels. And we should also think about how vessels themselves have their own biographies. They have as much change and meaning and mobility as, as other objects. Um, one of the challenges that I'm hoping will be answered in the future, but we aren't there yet, um, and Professor Krishnan is, is sort of the one, uh, one of the pioneers working on this, is actually where is related where manufactured. And again, our challenge is where are the kilns? We can't find the kilns. And when Professor Gunnar Ordner 
um, and Professor Pushpa Ratnam encouraged us to work in Jaffna, I have seen more varieties of related wear in Jaffna than I could have thought possible. Um, and related wear, I think we need to re-examine the whole concept of related wear and the use of relating. And Jaffna, where we know it's not manufactured because it's limestone and there's no limestone in those profiles, is an amazingly diverse collection. So we also have to think about how some of the trading ports are equally important and those patterns between the cities. So there is a huge amount of work still to be done. And that's why we published as much as we can within those volumes, particularly volume two, which has all the data. Volume three has the survey data. So others can question our conclusions. Too often publications come out without the raw data. So you can never try to reconstruct or question. We held the view was that we have reached certain sets of conclusions. We want others to question our work, to see can they actually um, come up with alternatives, but we have to publish the data to make sure. It's not an easy task. It's a massive task. It's horrible formatting. Um, but actually, you know, if only we had more publications like that where we can interpret. And also, if only we had more studies where we can look at both city and hinterland. So there's a lot to do. Yes. So um, there are two questions which are specifically asking you about um, some material culture. One is by Sri Lakshmi, uh, who asks if any jars or amphorae have been found, which I think you have answered in your yeah. presentation, but you can just get, give a brief answer to that. And then the second one is um, from which layer or level of stratification do you get carnelian ring yeah. by yeah. Ayush Gupta? Yeah. Yeah, no, uh, two very good questions. In terms of um, in terms of jars and amphora, um, I think Roberta Tomba has really powerfully demonstrated that an awful lot of what were originally interpreted as amphora actually shed light on the 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 sort of the trade in torpedo jars from the early uh, the, from the um, Sasanian early Islamic world. So I think that is really powerful and it in a way fills the gap, that Nestorian gap, because we do have evidence of Nestorian contact at Anuradhapura, there's a so-called church, and also places like Mantai, we have evidence of, um, of Nestorians. So, so we do have jars, we do not have amphora, but I have seen amphora from some of the other sites uh, because the monastic sites, which have not been fully published, have the most amazing materials, um, uh, incredible materials, particularly Jetavana with the flower altars, um, absolutely stunning materials. Um, in terms of the carnelian ring blank, um, that I put the picture of the carnelian ring blank, that actually dates to about the first century uh, BCE. But uh, we do have evidence of carnelian debitage and also blanked out um, uh, blanks for beads um, from probably about uh, third century, fourth century BCE. So earlier, but the ring blanks are later. At the beginning, we were really puzzled by what they were. We had lots of what we called earplugs. And then we realized that actually the ear, what we thought were earplugs were actually the central drilled part from the carnelian blanks. So once we began to build up the chain of operations, we began to go back through our lapidary work and reconstruct what we, what we had there. But, you know, we have early materials. So Indian Ocean trade is early. Um, and also, as I've argued up, um, elsewhere, it completely predates the Roman contact. And yeah. Okay, so uh, we have a 
uh, a participant from the Palmer Research Institute. And I asked him for his name, but he's not replied till now. But uh, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm unable to guess. But he identifies um, himself in the team with uh, Dr. Krishnan and you. So um, he comments, what a great opportunity to see and listen to a brilliant lecture from the Muziris site, just 400 kilometers from your site. It was really a yes. great transdisciplinary. I think you have recognized this person. I, I have, I have, I have. Please, could you let I've, me know? I've, I've, I believe it is uh, Professor Cherian. Cherian, yes. So I, 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 I didn't assume want it is. <laughs> yes. So, um, so he, he says that um, it was really a great transdisciplinary journey, which we have also aimed at Patanam, the, uh, especially the maritime significance and links of Anuradhapura was mind boggling yeah. and the chronology, artifacts, etc. not quite different uh, from Patanam. So mm. he has a question. Uh, what are the artifactual evidences for Buddhist, uh, the emergence of Buddhism or Buddhist origins in Anuradhapura and the dates? Yeah, yeah. Um, in terms, um, first of all, Professor Cherry and we had the pleasure of him visiting, and also I had the pleasure of visiting um, Patnam, which is, you know, such a splendid site. I would say even he would be quite excited by the variety of material produced by individuals like Professor Pusparandam and also Prashanagan Wardner um, in our work at, at Jaffna. In terms of, um, I would agree, Patnam has very close links um, with the sort of sequence that we have at Anuradhapura. Um, what is interesting, I think, with Anuradhapura is Mantai, which is the port city, actually doesn't really seem to have that, that Iron Age sequence there. So somewhere we are, we are missing the very early years. And it's not it's not Manti. Whether it means there is an earlier site elsewhere, um, we don't know. Maybe it wasn't hit at, at those excavations. In terms of uh, evidence for Buddhism, um, you know that that's that's quite challenging in terms of when you put a trench into an excavation, you know, into an early historic city site. Um, how do you ever interpret something as Buddhist as opposed to non-Buddhist? Now we do have some materials. So some of the graffito, uh, some of the graffiti we have, we have, for example, what looks like a stupa, but we know uh, stupas are not necessarily restricted to Buddhism. Um, we do have, and this dates to about first century BC, first century C, we have the wonderful glass hair curl made in glass with a small hole for a metal fixture. So what's really interesting is we've got some sort of uh, maybe uh, maybe hybrid um, attachment for whether it's uh, whether it's built in um, uh, wood, maybe it's uh, stone and it's attached. So that is what I would say, you know, very clear evidence um, in terms of the the archaeological sites. Third century BC is the date that we have for the majority of the monastic sites. Some of them have a little bit of earlier occupation. Um, practically speaking, one would assume that uh, there are there are connections about that time. But but you know, in a way, I I see the trap that um, Professor Cherian has set <laughs> um, in terms of. Actually, how does one identify early Buddhism within the archaeological record? How does one differentiate what is Buddhist from, uh, and would people, if you were at that time, ask them, would they identify with just one uh, religious affiliation? Or would they, like many of the communities today, have multiple affiliations? Um, so, so I think that is a question for a much broader lecture or even a conference. Um, mm -hmm. That would be, as a challenge to IIT Gandhinanga, mm -hmm. that would be actually a really interesting conference to say, what is the material culture of early Buddhism? 
Is it, is it materialistic so we can identify it? Is it eating practices? Is it residential practices? You know, that would be really exciting. Yeah, hint taken. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we, I, we have, uh, I think this can be um, uh, the penultimate question and this is by Sri Lankan, um, Vijay Pala Tikiri Bandara. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, um, the question is, um, did your research focus on the metallurgy of Anuradhapura and the hinterlands? And uh, uh, the participant is from Rajaratha University of Sri Lanka. Okay, um, we, we did not. So I realized that there are some real strengths in expertise. Professor Arjuna, for example, uh, we also had, of course, Jill Julif, who was, who was working within the region. Um, in terms of the metallurgy, what we did was we looked for evidence of metalworking. Um, so whether we had evidence of uh, crucibles, furnaces, um, and we were interested in Jill Julius' suggestion of roots um, with sort of monsoonal winds that she published on. Um, so sadly, we did not do the metallurgical analysis, um, but that's not to stop anyone actually following up that work. Um, what was one of the interesting patterns though that we did pick up was we had this um, perhaps rather overly simplistically Marxist perspective that in the early settlement, each area would be self-sufficient. It would be producing its own sort of lapidary work, metal work. And so true enough, when you look across the citadel, uh, and I was privileged to use, to have access to the data from Saran Angular, in the early phases, each area has access to its own metal working, its own stone working, et cetera, so manufacturing. I had predicted that what would happen over time as the state became centralized, as the king became more powerful, that we would find these activities restricted to perhaps the royal area. Um, what began to be absolutely clear was this pattern almost of um, localities continued all the way through into the medieval period. So what was really interesting was recognizing that certain patterns that were first there in the, uh, in, in the Iron Age in terms of manufacturing continued throughout the history of the occupation of the city, despite it going from a village to an imperial metropolis controlling the entire island and linked into Indian Ocean trade. And I think that is really interesting. It's a very distinctive pattern. And it suggests that we tend to have models of centralization, but actually, is that always the case? or for individual cities are the dynamics that lead to its success and intensification sometimes so strong that even when you come across uh, mechanisms like kings, and in the later periods we have uh, almost god kings, um, but actually the relationships of access surplus manufacturing remain exactly the same. Um, I explored some of these in my thesis um, and suggested that actually, perhaps often as archeologists, we are overwhelmed what we might call the kingly reading, which is the propaganda of architecture, of inscriptions where James Duncan had this word of the kingly reading when artifactually, sometimes we have a contestatory experience being acted out. Um, so, so I acknowledge that we could have done more on the me metallurgical work, and that is something really exciting to do. And I know that Professor Arjuna, I know as well that Jill Julius looked at it, um, but uh, 
sometimes there are limits to what one can do within a five-year project. True. So um, there is a, another very interesting question um, by Dr. Nuvan Abhayvardhana. Yes. Who asks, um, you are suggesting Anuradhapur as a theocratic landscape using the grants of irrigation to the monasteries in the hinterland. But number of inscriptions uh, mention private ownerships of irrigation works and local chieftains like Parumaka and yeah. Gamika. There's also one inscription in Natukanda uh, which mentions um, the village monastery has mortgaged the tank to a village council. So how are you suggesting that village monasteries acted as administrative centers since yeah. there were differently layered, uh, you know, different layers of administrations yeah. which are mentioned in the inscriptions? We, we used the phrase theocratic landscape as a way of exploring some of the provisional findings. And we published that and we put within it that as the project proceeded, as more data was produced, we would reevaluate that. And uh, some scholars um, took, uh, took offense at the term theocratic, um, which is interesting. Um, and they were of an opinion that it was actually um, an inappropriate uh, terminology. Uh, because it was Abrahamic um, in terms of its root being Theo for God. Now, it was a useful um, discussion because it helped us reevaluate. And that's when we began to pick up what were not what we would call orthodox monastic. But this at this period, after we'd written that paper, because that was only written at the beginning of the fieldwork, after a season or so, we began to pick up more sites that suggested a more contested landscape, a landscape of heterarchies rather than hierarchies. So at the beginning, we began to explore the idea, did we have a single hierarchy? And then after that paper, we began to actually begin to reflect whether we had instead heterarchies. So we changed our language and we abandoned theocratic. So we, I do not suggest theocratic landscape. And if you look at our later papers, and also if you look at the volume on Anuradhapura, what we went for was another terminology, which is uh, a temporality. Now, temporality actually is linked to the Buddhist temporality ordinance. So it's linked to a Sri Lankan colonial law, um, which recognized the independence of these landscapes and the immunities. So I think in answer, first of all, I would say theocratic landscape, we mentioned in an earlier formative paper, and then we moved to what we felt was a far more dynamic understanding of temporality, which would be far more important and also linked to Sri Lankan legal ordinances. And then we would say the landscape is highly complex. There is no single model that works. So a theocratic landscape would only work if you had a single hierarchy. We now recognize what we have is a series of heterarchies. So the fact that some inscriptions have immunities, some ins inscriptions relate to private ownership, some to village councils, actually supports this concept of heterarchy, of multiple overlapping hierarchies. All right, I think um, we have kind of covered almost all the questions. There's one last one, uh, and I think we should, you know, I kind of end with that, and maybe I'll ask Professor Michelle to chip in at the end. So the last question being, um, uh, which cultural timeline the torpedoes were found from, and what were the other associated materials? This comes from Pyle yeah. Sane. Yeah. Yes. Tor torpedo jars are Sasanian Islamic. And one of the challenges that we did find was that the upper levels have been very badly damaged by robber pitting. 
So I showed that slide of some of those huge rubber pits. So in terms of structural evidence, above the, uh, the pillared hall, the sequences there are quite, quite uncertain. The richest material we picked up were, was actually within the fills of those rubber pits right at the top in terms of the Chinese and the early Islamic. But in terms of the torpedo jars, mainly associated with the, uh, with the um, monodrome luster wares. So within that, within that sort of uh, medi early medieval period that we have. Um, we do have evidence, I believe that I've seen, um, of uh, Sasanian Islamic blue glaze ware. So in the foundations of the pillared hall, which must date to probably first, second century CE, we do actually have some fabric, which is very, very clearly um, Sasanian Islamic blue glaze wares. Um, so that could be Parthian. Um, Dr. Jeremy Adler, I know, had some vessels that he was certain was Parthian as well, but, um, but it was fragmentary. Okay, so I, um, I think these were all the pertinent questions from the Q&A box, and now I ask Professor Manino if he has something to add. <laughs> Um, I, I'm not sure, in fact, but I, I want to thank Professor Cunningham for a brilliant talk. I think we should have given you six or seven hours at least <laughs> to discuss this to the topic because it's, it's immense in scope, obviously. So mm -hmm. thank you so much for whetting uh, our appetite. Uh, I have a question in mind, but I think it's, it's not the right time to, to deal with it. Maybe you could just point me to to where it has already been discussed. It's about the connection between this early urbanism in Sri Lanka and in South India. And, uh, you know, previously we used to have dates like two or 300 BCE for, uh, for you know, the rise of cities in, in, in Tamil Nadu, for example. Now it's been pushed back somewhat like Poruntal or, yeah. or Kodumala, yeah. Patanam also. But th those chronologies, unfortunately, are a little bit insecure we, we we don't have too many you know yeah. Uh, yeah. secure dates we don't have a proper chronology of dating etc um I, I want to know do you see any influence or is it something of a simultaneous rise at some point or is it that that south indian urbanism um, gets inputs yeah. through interchange from from uh, early sri lankan urbanism and also the you know um a corollary point about uh, Brahmi, because the Brahmi script, I remember Raymond Alchin defending an early chronology for Brahmi script in, in Anuradhapura. And now we do have dates which are claimed to be 500, 500 BC in, in Tamil Nadu, in uh, Patanam perhaps. So how do you see this whole, it, it's a very complex uh, yeah. question and I do not ask you to deal with it exhaustively. Yes, uh, yes. Because you might be exhausted in the process, but maybe some pointers, yeah. and and if it has been discussed elsewhere, some references will do. Okay, I, I mean, thank you, um, Professor Michelle, because they are really, really interesting questions, and one of the one of the challenges that we have is within Sri Lanka, Anuradhapura is not a unique site, because we also have Kantarodai which has a deep sequence. Unfortunately, it's had a very, it's had a series of unfortunate excavations, the same with Manti, um, which have meant that it's never come through. But we have evidence of deep sequences and Saran Derniagla claimed also, uh, and certainly I believe him, of deep sequences at Tissa Maharama. Now, personally, you know, right on the Southern tip, Personally speaking, I would not be surprised if you have as early urban forms within, within Peninsular India. Um, I think the challenge has been, uh, or rather the benefit we had was we threw money at radiocarbon dating. So from the excavations at Anuradhapura, 
we had uh, maybe 30 radiocarbon dates in that one trench. Seren Deriniagla pursued radiocarbon dating as the top priority for the citadel. So his prophetic claims of early Brahmi being earlier than than Ahsokan, uh, the Ahsokan pillars, actually it, it was a matter of time until people firstly washed every shirt to look to see if they had graffiti, and secondly, getting dates. And I think there's still within South Asia this tradition of one radiocarbon date for a site, maybe two. So I think if there was a systematic um, set of research where some of the big sites were going back to, like Darani Kota, uh, for example, um, uh, like, uh, like um, Brahmagiri, you know, these sites, if we really targeted some of the big sites and look for them and see how deep are they, how deep are those sequences? Um, I... And I'm, I'm torn between either, either anticipating that not everywhere needs to urbanize. Complexity can be reached in very different ways. And if you were to look at the cemetery in Brahmagiri and suggest that that's not linked to a highly complex, highly stratified society, I would, I would say, you know, you're, you're wrong. It clearly is. So it may be that the absence, so the absence of urbanization is, I would not attribute to Lemuria. Um, I would, I would probably attribute it to, to either our own archaeological failings, that we have not systematically done what Siran Deriniagla did, you know, who else would have put three meter by three meter by 10 meter deep trenches, sondages to, to pursue this. So we haven't done that. We haven't rigidly decided that it is better to get 30 radiocarbon dates from a single site than scatter radiocarbon resources across multiple sites. Or the other one is that actually we don't necessarily need an urbanization for a distinctive stratification to occur. So I'm, I'm personally torn between whether it's archaeological methodologies and our failings to, to strategically advance it, or whether we also need to think, actually, just because it's not urbanized doesn't mean it's, it's any lesser. And I think, you know, maybe if we think about those amazing chariot burials that are coming out now um, from UP, um, that completely rebalances or resets the clock on, do we always focus on urban forms and urban communities as the zenith, the, you know, the, 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 the peak of, development, or actually are there as complex, as exciting, as stratified communities which don't actually necessarily go down the route of urbanization? Um, and I think those are really, really interesting questions. And, you know, those are questions that the, the next generations will, will have a really exciting time solving, I hope. And in terms of the early Brahmi, I mean, Raymond was absolutely clear when he saw the shirts um, that Saran produced that, that there is a developmental sequence one can pick up of, of becoming more, um, more uh, uniform in the process. And also, excitingly, at the point where they almost disappear, we started getting ivory and bone bookends. So rectangular, almost a bit like a, um, a ruler with a hole at one end, um, that we must assume is when ola leaf, palm leaf manuscripts start coming in. So I think all of that was really clear. And, and we shouldn't be surprised. And some of the newspapers I remember put, Lankans wrote before Indians. Now, you know, it, Saran was the pioneer 
And many people in the early years said he was incorrect. Early Brahmi could not be earlier than third century BC. He persistently demonstrated and encouraged us, and certainly we supported his findings, that before the third century BC explosion of inscriptions across South Asia on the pillars and on the, the rock inscriptions, epigraphy inscriptions have already been there, but they're connected to trade and ownership. Shouldn't be surprising. So thank you, thank you for your two um, your two traps. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Robin. It, it's 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 a real pleasure to have covered all this field with you, and um, we hope to pursue it further. No, 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 definitely, definitely. Thank you. <laughs>